Hello and welcome to Think Peace, the podcast with your host, Aaron. I will be here to guide you on your newest journey in the podcast scene. And if you hadn't, this is your first time listening, then I bid you welcome. And thank you for giving my podcast a chance and considering to listen to this for the future. And if you're, like I said, new to this, I also have a newsletter that I publish every week, which is actually the transcript that I read on for every podcast that I do. And so if you want to be multiple steps ahead of what the podcasts are at, by all means, go and sign up for my newsletter and you will receive it every week in your email box. So if you haven't already, you should consider doing that. But if you're just a podcaster, that's perfectly fine too. I'm available on all podcasts uh, where they're all available, where they're all located. So without further ado, we'll, we'll begin with today's podcast. Now for this thing piece, this was my third installation. So our shorthand will look a lot like this, or in this way, sound a lot more like this. It looks like we made it to September finally. Boy howdy, a month has this felt like 10 years. Making it to our third think piece, yeah. With the closing of the RNC, the last of the conventions, we are only 62 days till the American presidential election. Yet so much time for more surprises to come. The world is re-entering an era of great power competition through, I would like to call it, the War of Tigers, featuring many Asian and Pacific powers, i.e. China, US, Japan, India, Australia, and Southeast Asia. Constant civil unrest seems to be a mainstay in the US anymore. Though, if you look at the stock market, you'd think the US was only primed for reaching the pinnacle of success. But it's not all gloom and doom. In our pandemic-ridden world, some new technologies are in the spotlight, from AI becoming your decision makers to having shotguns with man's best friend. <clears throat> so this, obviously, was featuring some of the coolest articles I could come up with, as well as on the whole avenue of the presidential elections, which obviously hindsight tells us what the outcome was at the time, it was very, very indecisive, and it was very questionable what would happen. As in the RNC's the National or the Republican National Convention, which really was a show, not a showstopper, I would say, compared to what would come. But needless to say, it was uh, quite disgusting, and honestly, was just the beginning of the whole downhill spiral of the Republican Party. And as the War of the Tigers which is an interesting concept that I picked here in this one because uh, usually the, the term the tigers in uh, Asia is termed for like the Asian tigers, which is considered to be the uh, Vietnam, South Korea, uh, Japan, and some of the um, quote unquote miracle economies that really, really like exploded in the 70s and 80s that they were called the little tigers of Asia where their economies were quite robust and their economic prowess was on the rise at the time and so that's where that term comes from as in war of the tigers though i was more or less referring it in the sense of where you had competing interests would they still be the dominant reason as in like competing interests between say the philippines and the uh you know the Vietnamese or Malaysians with their competing interests, not necessarily one another, but their neighbors, would that overshadow their uh, dealings with a more aggressive China? Which, you know, I was at the time speculative. I didn't know necessarily what may or may not happen. But considering what I know now, it's kind of like, you, you know, Maybe, you know, there are sides gearing up in the greater struggle of the future of, you know, power spheres, of the great powers. And the onset of great power competition is absolutely the uh, inevitable, the inevitable outcome of what's coming up. 
and it's a boy howdy <laughs> yeah it is it's a great power competition coming up soon and it's already happening now and literally for fun for the references that i made in these specific countries let's go with japan india australia they themselves have been creating a system that is more or less geared to uh, themselves. Uh, there is a new rising like group they call themselves between those countries and a fourth country and they call themselves the Quad, which is literally a um, it's literally those three countries and another one which may or may not surprise you but actually it's US <laughs> so it's uh, the US Japan Australia and India and they are in what is called they call it for short quad but it's actually the quadrilateral security dialogue which is this whole group where these countries are working together or they're actually in talks because they have common interests and a common enemy which china has in this case aggressively made themselves appear uh, appear excuse me as the aggressor of the world in this sense which is you know is what it is but I specifically picked those those countries because later on I will talk about them more, but just for fun facts later, the US, Japan, and India, and Australia have a group together that is called the Quad. So it's pretty funny there. I would mention now. before This was before also they were really serious into that. And obviously the stock market was crazy. It was still going up. And now it's just astronomically ridiculous i mean it's in it's in the ballpark of speculation almost entirely you know but at the same time there is some safe bouts in there there's some safe considerations some trade investments uh, trade and investments that are uh very solid and efforts to you know keep them maintainable and also feasible without the extreme volatility or the extreme craziness of going up and down radically and you know some of the stories in this one are actually pretty interesting to say the very least the ai beacon our decisions and so on and so forth it reminds me of a novel which i'll mention it later but player piano by kurt vonnegut it's actually really interesting when they get into this sort of scenario and it's it's an excellent book to read but continuing on to our next section Continuing on to the market in this podcast. Fun fact about the current lay of the markets. The S&P 500 has reached historical highs, as, has, as have the NASDAQ and the Dow indexes. But that's not the fun fact, psych. What has been driving the S&P 500's major gains and soaring heights has been almost entirely five and that's five the number five companies which have made up more than half of the s p's entire value wild right could you guess who these five companies are come on i'll give you a hint just a quick one they're all tech giants and you use them nearly every day of your existence are you stumped well they're apple facebook Amazon, Alphabet, which is Google's parent company, which means Google, and Microsoft. Now, try to figure out how in a pandemic-stricken world these giants are having the best years of their existence. <laughs> Take a wild guess. So, this, they are in the order of such. I will name the company, and I'll let announce their stock indicator, which is Pretty much the letters that you can find them under if you look in any stocks or any stock apps such as E-Trade or any of those, they're weak at that time that's valuation, either a positive or a negative, and then the price of each stock. So what I will go about is I will say how much they gain in that week or loss and then I will tell you about the price of that stock at that time. So this is dated, but if you compare this data currently to the current data 
I'm suspecting, which I'm not really suspecting, they've almost gained significant amounts. If not one third of their value, they've done it more. And then in some cases, they split. But in this case, we'll just go as they are. We'll start with our biggest big boy, Amazon, which Amazon has the indicator of AMZN. They at that time had gained $161.65 for the week, mind you. And that whole stock now, mind you, you can buy yourself one whole Amazon stock for $3,511.90, which is, uh, it's uh, not chump change, that's for sure. It's more than I make. And then going to the next highest one is Google. And in this case, it's actually considered alphabet class C as the stock. And then its indicator is G-O-O-G. They had a good one. They were positive $59.17 for the week, bringing their whole value of one stock, mind you, is $1,667.17. And that one stock could be yours for that price, right? Crazy, isn't it? Then we have our next big contender, Facebook, with the indicator of FB. <laughs> Imagine that where this week or that week they had gained $12.44 for the week and making their total stock mind you you can buy one share of star of not Starbucks excuse me I was I'm thirsty of Facebook for $296.45 come on now you know you want to be chumping up those dollars for it the next one was Microsoft with MSFT as their indicator they had a good run, positive $10.09, bringing their whole stock value of one stock, $228, almost even, which was, I mean, that's pretty good value, considering where they were maybe 10 years ago at like, I think it was uh, when I originally got into them, they were like $60 a share. Yeah, that's a substantial gain for sure. And that's just, and this is just in the early pandemic too. The next one we have is Apple and they go with the indicator of AAPL. They had a good run of $8.80. Now, they were at the time splitting their stock four ways, which um, after the split, their value for one stock was $135. But this is before the split, mind you, they were $505. So for reference, the split was designed to increase the, um, not the value of the company, but to increase the opportunity for more investors to buy into the company. And it would dilute the previous ownership's valuations, you know. So you may own one share that was $555, but instead, when they split it, they broke it down to five shares or four shares, making it $135. So you would have four shares at that price specifically. So it doesn't, it diluted the individual stock itself, but you become an owner of more stocks. But at the same time, since there was more of them, you kind of just really, you lost more than you actually gained. Needless to say, it gave an opportunity for people, retail investors like you and me, an opportunity to buy into the company. And that's what they were banking on, that more of us would buy into it, increasing its valuation, increasing its capital flow, capital flow being cash flow, which means more money in their pockets to spend on what they wanted to spend and less worrying about the assets or their lack of ability to really spend. They wanted more bang for their buck and they wanted more uh, purchasing power and you know a war chest for the future that was coming up. Needless to say, that's what they did. And so everybody could buy into it. But as for Amazon, like honestly, Amazon just is a monstrosity of monstrosities. They literally are behemoths in their own realm and they are just constantly expanding into other realms. Um, at this point in time, I didn't know or really the concept of the unions fight. The struggle was not a big thing 
but it is obviously now we know the verdict of what happened in the unionization but amazon is is a i mean if you're an investor and you're a business person amazon was you know quintessentially the business to get with into but i mean at the same time you know if you're a common man or woman or person in general and you're you know just trying to make ends meet and stuff and amazon's offering yeah the wages seem good but amazon is just to be honest they're a tyrant and they're quite ruthless to their employees overall and you know yeah you can get cheaper products but at the same time you know at what cost you know how much you know how much of your humanity must be given up in order to you know accept those cheap costs or your limitations of what you can and cannot afford but at the same time if you're looking at it in that sense what do you really need that you have to be you know what what do you really have to buy from amazon you know i mean uh what what is so necess what is the necessity that you have to have you know if you have to order it online and such then generally google is google that's what you look up on primarily for everything search engine wise and your maps most of the time depending and then also android you know your phones like samsung um any of those guys they use android and so google has the proprietary ship of that and so they're just a behemoth of their own rights are they necessarily as evil as amazon uh, yeah um i would say so i mean just like apple they're they're pretty evil i mean to be honest <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I am going to show the bias. I'm already showing bias now, so I'll admit to the bias that I do have. I believe any corporation or any CEO that has literally, for example, Jeff Bezos, roughly last time I checked, he made around $27 million a day. If any individual can earn that kind of money in a day, I inherently am just very uh how would you say uh distrusting of someone like that it really doesn't matter if they've achieved the american dream i don't believe uh, the american dream was designed to be so rich that you would actively focus on becoming more rich while force squandering the poor and crushing the middle classes to extract more wealth from them like literally you know like imagine if you will uh you got one of them little uh lemon or orange like graters that you're you are trying to make orange juice and so you got actual oranges you cut them in half and you put them on this little cylinder and you squish it around and it drains the juice out of them right imagine if you would that that's what he's doing to get that extra wealth out you know Oh, I'm offering quality assurance. I'm offering products. I'm offering good jobs. But then at the same time, you know, in order to get, you know, how much more juice can you get out of an orange, right? And you just keep squishing and squishing and squishing and until you're, you you just shredded the innards out of it. And it's like, well, there's still more juice. So you just, you keep going until you're literally to the rhymes and the, you know, you're at that point and you're just like, you know, you keep pushing it until there's literally nothing left. And at that point, yeah, you know, when you're in that analogy, yeah, you want to get as much as you juice you can out of the orange. But at the same time, how much is it to the point that you're really actually not getting any more juice? You're just grinding the rhymes and, or, and it just doesn't really matter what you're doing. You're just doing that. And we are the orange and he is the grinder in this point. He's grinding us in his Amazon machine. And so thus, you know, it may not affect you directly, but indirectly it does affect you, which is a really hard thing to get across to anybody. But aside from that, when it comes to extreme wealth, I mean, the problem also is it lies in, can you really fathom what $27 million is? Can you really imagine what $1 million looks like? It's already hard enough to imagine if you will, a thousand dollars, right? You can, you can, you can visually imagine that. Now imagine ten thousand dollars stacked on a table, right? Imagine them in a hundred hundred dollar bills, right? You can imagine, you can get a rough idea of that that looks like, right? You've seen what a hundred dollar bill looks like. You've seen a stack of them before, a thousand dollars or even ten thousand dollars, maybe. Now imagine, you know, you keep progressing up higher, a hundred thousand dollars. 
Now that's even, that gets hard, right? You're trying to imagine what $100,000 in stacks of hundreds looks like. Now jump up to a million dollars and that's really re getting harder. Like at that point, you really can't imagine because you've really not seen how many $100 bills have to be stacked on a table to make you understand what the value of all that is. But then you jump up to a hundred million. You know, I mean, a hundred million is just, you're, you're hitting astronomical numbers in that sense. Like, you know, that's just, you can't, that's hundreds of thousands. That's, uh, that's literally just 10, $100,000. That's a hundred, like, <laughs> that's a hundred, ten thousand dollars right there. That's literally a thousand, one thousand dollars right there. <laughs> you, you like see see how the numbers just get l really ludicrous and you're just like this this is absurd i don't get it necessarily but now we as individuals most of the time i mean some people will achieve 200 to 300 thousand dollars a year right i mean you don't see that you don't ever see oh here's your here's your pay two hundred thousand dollars a year here it is all one lump sum you never see that it would make you probably consciously rethink about how you spend money and how you do it but like simply put you never see that but you you oh well i make three i make two hundred thousand dollars i make three hundred thousand dollars i make that a year which is you know that's not you know that's not saying you're rich but it's also not saying you're entirely poor but you're in that middle vacuum of middle class. You're a little bit upper, but you're not necessarily the higher enchilada of wealthy middle class, but you're, you know, you're in there. But needless to say, you really just, you know, that's what you make a year. That is the value of your labor. That is the value of who you are in a year. Put it in that term, right? Now, <laughs> okay this is this gets harder because i'm trying to imagine it myself i've never honestly i've never seen this kind of money in my personal life so it's also very hard for me to reconcile what it will look like but i've been close enough to seeing what a hundred thousand dollars looks like in real life and it really is how would you say uh, I can picture it. I've seen it once in my life. And so I seen the absurdity of what that would look like. I mean, we've seen movies, right? But in real life, it has a whole different feeling. It's, it's just, it, it's hard. It's really hard unless you've personally visualized it. But imagine $27 million a day. Imagine if your average American worker you know, makes, you know, higher enchilada or not higher, just mid tier middle class makes 200 to 300,000 a year. How many more, like out of a million, you know, that's three, six, nine, you know, three people could be paid a million dollars, you know, from the just $1 million, three people could be paid that for a year. Now, 27 million? I mean, I'm not going to do the math right here, obviously. I'm not uh, doing very well in math today, obviously. I had to count on my fingers. <laughs> but that kind of income is just crazy, right? The, if you're making that a year. But individuals like this are making it a day. A single day. <laughs> That's at what point does someone need the kind of wealth like that i once had a individual tried to justify they used the number fifty thousand. said i make what we'll speculate i make fifty thousand a year do you think i want to pay for some of these things i these 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 uh welfare recipients or this and sort of stuff and these taxes and i had to revise them and look at them i said well do you realize that about five years ago, $36,000 was considered poverty in the United States of America. That's what you make annually. That's what that was considered. And I have not looked, but with inflation and some other things, I've heard and I've done some statistical under, uh, workings that roughly around 44 
thousand dollars annually is considered poverty in the United States of America. It's the average poverty line. It's what the U.S. government considers poverty. If you make forty-four, around forty to forty-four thousand a year. So I looked at him. I said, "That's that's where your that's where you lie with that number you just gave me." I was like, "That's not even you know you're not even middle class. You're just you're a hairline fracture above poverty." <laughs> it's like, you know, that's, you know, I understand where you're going, but you really don't understand the concepts of financial money. Like, if you're considering 50000 being some number, honestly, look at a car. You Literally, just look at a new car. Nine times out of ten, with $50,000, you could not buy it. And then you're expected to make those kind of payments for that kind of car in a year's time. Just like you make on your salary. So if you're making $50,000 and then you also got on top of that rent, you got on utilities, you got not only utilities, but heaven forbid, you got a car payment. Plus on top of that, you got to live, you got to eat. And then on top of that, you got whatever other expenditures you have to do. You got a phone bill. I didn't include that in the utilities because some people like to think, oh, well, a phone is a utility, is a specialty. It's a luxury. Or a car is a luxury. Well, honestly, they say, like, you know, driver's license is a luxury, but it's not. It's simply not. It's not a luxury. I don't care what anyone says. I mean, until the United States comes to terms that, you know, driving should be, honestly, driving should be held not significantly better, but it should be controlled in the sense of, well, maybe not controlled because people get trigger happy when you say control, but it should be handled in a manner that is more critical to how valuable it is to an individual. You have to drive to get to work. Most people have to walk. And in our society, we frown, shun, and disparage people from walking because we're like, you're, you're, you're beneath me. You're, you don't drive. And it's like, but that's, that's not fair. That's not right. Why would you criminalize or demonize these people that have to walk to work? And they're willing to, they're walking to work to make ends meet. So then they can buy this two or three or four or five, maybe $6,000 car that's going to be garbage later and they're going to have nothing but problems and they're going to be stuck in this poverty cycle, which poverty yields poverty and you can never honestly get out of it. And when people act like you can, it's really, you know, they're like, well, look at these, look at these individuals, look at Bill Gates, look at, look at Jeff Bezos, look at that. It's like, well... Oh, you're making me unpack something that I don't really want to get into because then I have to expect that you went to school and you actively paid attention, you know, and that's also a detriment to them. It's like, you know, I don't want to assume you don't know anything, but at the same time, it's like our school systems really do not, they pride themselves, well, not enough in properly educating what we need to know and no not like oh you need to learn how to balance a checkbook or do taxes no that's not what you need to do you need to be able to conscientiously think about things you need to be able to proactively you know formulate thoughts you need to be actively engaged in your society and fixing your environment around you not just permeating yourself and making yourself significantly better than anything else right you're supposed to help everybody but not really. I mean, you're not obligated to help everybody. There's, there's no possibility of doing that. But you can contribute enough. And it doesn't have to be, oh, I'll donate some money or I'll volunteer. You don't, always, you don't have to do that. But what you can do is stime the stigmatisms that really permeate through people. You know, you can... When somebody's like, well, all them people just getting them free checks, having, five, having 57 babies, and you can be like, well, okay, have you, have you been to a elitist party? Have you been to these people? Have you interacted with somebody that has more than enough money to complain about a, a deduction in like an allowance or something or how the, like they're talking about the 
<laughs> what one would consider an annual salary that they're complaining about their monthly allowance is being cut to. Okay, can you can you can you go to these events where you see the elite elite of the elite, you know, rubbing elbows together and they're like, oh, I got my Chardonnay and it it's a thousand it's twenty thousand dollars a bottle and here's and they have like twenty thousand dollar bottles like fifty or a hundred of them and they're just you know casually giving out drinks like they're just no tomorrow at these events and they have food that's like tiny little spectacles of like whatever and they're like ten thousand dollars a meal or a plate and you know they're giving them as hors d'oeuvres and then they you know at these events and it's free to get in if you know the right people and it's just like you sit there and you watch these people you know consume tens of thousands of dollars of quantities of food in like a you know in a span of like two to three hours at these parties and you know these events and then you're just sitting there and you have these people that are like, look at these welfare recipients. They get another baby and another two thousand dollars a month, and it's like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you, you sit there and it's like, huh, a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars a month, and it's like, <laughs> you just you just sat there and watched like hundreds of people at this gallia just you know ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a pop on a on a bottle of champagne, and everybody sipping. You know, having drinks and they're having multiple of them. You know, in three or four hours when this poverty-stricken, I apologize, but idiot is just wallowing in their own poverty and they don't realize it or they just accepted that that's what their life is. And so they assume society hates them as it actively does and actively reminds them that it hates them. So they're nine times out of ten not going to be fair with you, which is, again, what the other side of that spectrum does too those super rich people are looking at you like i'm gonna take everything you got you're stupid you can't stop me and you're not gonna stop me and i'm gonna take everything you got and if you got anything else i'll take more of it and i'll take even your firstborn and they actively do so you know i get because you see it every day yeah sure you're gonna hate it more but at the same time there's a cause to it. Quit looking at the effect and look at the cause. That's the only way you'll stop seeing the effect you're seeing every day. And actively stime the stigmatism of that. And if you can work on your own bias and your own personal, you know, grudges in it, then you are actively changing what society will be like for futures to come for future generations to come and that is more that is more effort more uh promising than any sort of volunteer work you can do which i'm not diminishing volunteer work or donations by all means if you can and are able to do it then do it but if you cannot and you're not able to it's perfectly acceptable Work on yourself. Be a better person. Yeah, sure, you're gonna get ripped, you're gonna get gypped, and you're gonna get you're gonna see people that are honestly undeserving of it. Which I mean there are those that do that. But you know, if you look around, you know, and you see these people Take a conscious understanding real quick before you want to, ah, oh, look at them, oh, oh, look at them, look, they got flirty kids, ah, oh, they're, they're, they're jipping us, they're trying to, they're trying to get a, you know, they're trying to get a $5 meal, and they're, tr they're getting a $10 meal, and they're trying to get it for $5, how dare they, no, but, but before you decide to go on that tangent, before you do that, look around you and see if you see one rich person, just, just do that. Just take a, take a small moment and look around and see if you see a rich person. And I'm not talking about those people that drive BMWs and Mercedes Benz. Chances are, wherever you're living, the rich people, nine times out of ten, you don't see them. And for good reason. Why would they mingle with the commoners? Why would they mingle with the riffraff? Come on. Be realistic. The real people are the one, the real problem with society are the ones you can't see because they're smart enough to keep away because guess what you're going to do? You're going to hate on the dredges of society and you're going to hate on them. Fun fact, uh, the government spends significantly less money, and I mean by a percentile of five, roughly 5 to 8% of its entire GDP 
its entire GDP, mind you. That includes on the welfare, which would be food stamps, uh, necessarily unemployment, um, Medicaid, Medicare, all those insurance things, and any of the government services. They spend roughly 5 to 8% of the GDP, right? The American government spends that much on supporting its citizens. It literally takes in nearly 0% revenue on corporations such as Amazon, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and Apple, who literally, literally make trillions of dollars in a year. And people like Jeff Bezos and those guys who make $27 million a day, which are the richest men and women in the world, mind you, 198 billionaires currently reside in America. They pay less taxes than you. And when you're like, oh, less taxes, like what? They don't pay taxes. Let me correct myself. They pay nothing. Why? Because one, they can afford to. Two, they can get away with it. And three, who's going to stop them? And ain't no, ain't the middleman because he's like, one day I'll be like them. Or oh, I'm part of the Republican Party. Or I'm part of that party and one day I'm going to be rich. Well, reality check. You're never going to be rich like them. You're not going to be it. Sucks. Sorry. I would like to be rich like them too and be so rich that I can go to the Virgin Islands on one of my planes on my air cl- air on my blue jet company or maybe get on my company rocket and fly up to Mars or you know have one of my drones and my company carry me off to one of the many islands I own. <laughs> but I'm not and I don't. I'm never going to be able to. Which is I mean, if that's kind of one of your goals in life, then yeah, that's 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 gonna be a sucky reality to accept. And I understand you don't want to accept it, but you know, <laughs> it's something you gotta accept. Just like you're never gonna get that date with that one person that you're really about, but they're just not about you and they just are not into you. But you're like, maybe one day, and you're like, mm, no, it's not gonna happen. I mean, unless you ask them, then when they flatly reject you, or, you know, they may say yes. You never know until you try, right? Well, that's the optimism I got for you now. But the reality is, chances are, no. You're never going to be as rich as these people are. And they affirmatively are going to make sure you don't even come remotely close. You can dream about it. Oh, of course you can dream about it. And we'll celebrate it. And we will parade it around and say, look at us, look at us. We're billionaires. Look at us. We're billionaires. It's Our lives are so good. You could be like us. And it's like, mm, you really have to have a lot of things really going for you. <laughs> you literally have to be like, oh, I made it to Harvard, but I'm going to drop out and I'm going to start my own companies. I made it to Yale and I'm going to just drop out my own company and I'm going to start my own business. I made it to Oxford and I'm just going to drop out and start my own companies. I mean, <laughs> you have to be up that absurdity level to do that. And, well, we're not. We're never going to be that. But, huh, I guess market got a little long for us. So that's my tangent for that. And I apologize only because I only intended to read the market and only explain a little bit about the companies. But I went on my triad, so well, I guess it's just part of the whole podcast now. So on to better news or chances are worse news. Needless to say, let's go on to our next section. Now, moving on to our next section, what in the world? Now, this has some stories that at the time were relevant, but as of now are uh, quite a bit dated. But that doesn't mean that I will uh, detract from them. I will instead read them and get provide the links, but also add additional factors into it and um events that have changed since then or any new additions as of the time that i wrote to now so beginning with one island nation taiwan's island defense minister believes china lacks the ability to invade the island nation 
spanning only 100 miles or 161 kilometers from mainland China, the Taiwan Strait is not so easily traversable due to China's lack of amphibious landing craft. This comes on the tail end of the finalization of the 10-year deal to purchase F-16 fighters from Lockheed Martin at $62 billion. China sees Taiwan as an estranged province, while the island has remained self-governed since the 50s. So, since the writing of this, the U.S. has obviously uh, grown significantly more interested in the island and its preservation and has since increased potential deals to sell the island more weapons to defend itself against the Chinese. And also, since then, it has been perceived that it's estimated by easily... I believe 2027, China will have the capabilities to actually invade the island nation. Now, how successful that is, is a completely different topic, but they will have, it, it's expected with the current growth of the Navy, the Chinese uh, Navy, the, pip, the, the People's Liberation Army's Navy will have the capabilities to invade the island uh, by uh, 2027, but that does not mean it would be successful and not without massive bloodshed. But still yet, the Chinese have been sending sorties over and around the um, airspace of Taiwan since, and has been putting pressure on the Taiwanese and their air force, which is also additionally given the Chinese air force pilots airtime and practice which is a bonus for them and also it's a projection of their power and demonstrating that they have the capacity to send sorties and dominate or uh rather command the super air supremacy in the area so and also with the pressure being put on the taiwanese it's very costly militarily to continuously respond to each sortie that the Chinese send and they are continuously doing this and it also includes that the amount of fuel they're spending repairs and then this simple wear and tear on not only their equipment but also their pilots where they are significantly less numerous than the Chinese in all realms of this so it is much more taxing on the island as opposed to the Chinese. So that is the current situation based off of uh, today and a few other weeks' readings compared to uh, this article's bit. Moving on. No. <clears throat> Our next story is Kentucky, the gigabit state? Question. After over two and a half years of construction, the city of Lexington, Kentucky, and Metronet finished the citywide installation of their fiber optic network lines, installing more than 4.4 million feet throughout the city and costing around $75 million, putting Lexington on the map as one of the few cities to offer the service to its citizens and one of the largest in the nation, which since then it has been gradually expanding and being offered to the citizenry of Lexington, Kentucky. And since then, um, speeds have been mm, markedly noticeable, but it hasn't reached the full gigabyte process of everybody getting it. So it is still a limbo sort of thing where a big chunk of the city has it, but certain areas are still without it and without the service. And the service of the group per se, Metronet, is off and on customer service wise. They don't really have any specific locations like offices the same way as say like Spectrum or the other um, big conglomerate um, internet companies and telecommunications. But they are on the scene, they're active, and I see them occasionally when I was actively looking at the internet. But since then, it is a pretty substantial project and for a city Lexington size, it's a astounding feat to really push for this. And then especially, again, I'm going to emphasize where it's located, in Kentucky, which is a state that is prideful on its um, 
lack of any internet accessibility in most of the country besides the cities. And considering fiber optic is one of the highest tiers of internet accessibility and uh, broadband wise connections, it is very, um, I would say, it's a very good step forward and progressive, very progressive in most ways. And honestly, when you as a city, county, or a state look into upgrading your infrastructure for internet wise, you're only encouraging further not only use, but also more businesses you'll be attracting. Because in the current digital age, it's not enough to have the infrastructure for roads, construction for warehousing and factories and you know office spaces and whatnot but you absolutely need to have high speed internet to not only the citizenry but also for businesses and have a competing edge against other cities and states in the united states and the world because if you're lacking in internet you're simply just going to be lacking in the overall perspective of competing business-wise why would a company like Amazon ever want to go to a place that necessarily doesn't have fiber optic or the highest speeds of internet possible, like gigabytes? It's just, it would never happen. And small businesses just simply cannot compete when you have a loading page that takes up to five minutes to load a page because your provider, AT&T or Spectrum or Comcast or one of those guys only offer barely even 125 megabytes of speed, which is crazy. But, you know, there's some places that offer 25 megabytes uh, and that's like satellite Internet and stuff and further remote places. And it's just it's unheard of. It's a re it's a big handicap for the you know inequality in income and per se it could be the great equalizer of you know econ the you know, economy and for people in remote areas but it just simply is a huge or monumental infrastructure project that just it's really hard to overcome and tech companies just won't or telecommunications companies will absolutely not invest in it and they never will they don't see a profit in it, and that's the reason why you have these areas that are lagging behind substantially in getting broadband, getting anything faster than, say, your basic dial-up speeds. So it would take a governmental body to actually go in and push for it, but at the same time, you have these telecommunication companies that are like, oh, no, 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 we're going to encourage legislation to really you know, penalize and put down any public works that are like that because otherwise we cannot charge you know the hundred two hundred dollars for 25 megabytes of speed and honestly the stranglehold that these guys hold on them and then with the fcc originally held by a literal ex executive of like comcast it's just you have a system that's just geared against the little man or the little person ever getting ahead in life and so you have to go in there and systematically dismantle all these just egregious laws that are against anybody having a chance at life or a fair opportunity at any form of you know economic progress or any chance of getting ahead in life because you have these big massive corporations and telecommunication companies that are just so geared to it geared to just just completely draining dry what little they can get out of everyone and then just punishing anyone that tries to get out of there so it's just really this sort of you know process of uh it's you know no one really wants a city or anybody and nor does a city or state want to maintenance and handle all that but at the same time if it's not there and they're looking for ways to progress it's like you know what are you gonna do and so it's a stranglehold and a death sentence that these corporations and telecommunication companies have over our livelihoods and it will just not change until we actively get out there and change not only legislation but also promote in, uh, infrastructure works that provide these sort of things with like a city installing gigabyte and fiber optic networks in order to provide high speed internet in order to encourage companies and businesses and others to start or come to the city which is obviously a benefit, uh, benefit to the communities around them. But I digress. Many others would probably disagree in 
on uh, in ways that are just either unsightly or just downright wrong because of their lack of knowledge in it, which is fair. You know, some people have their opinions, but it is what it is. So for our next article, it is titled A 30 Year Decay Bust. The boom of globalization is coming to an end for Vietnam after a 30-year success rate. Like with the rest of the world, the pandemic has taken its toll on the nation's economy, specifically on export and tourism. Many garment companies and companies in other sectors are seeing slashes in consumer spending abroad as major economies like the U.S. slow down due to the virus. Vietnam's star was one of the brightest in the Southeast uh, Asia, in Southeast Asia, excuse me, converting from an agricultural dominant economy to a manufacturing powerhouse. Now, fun fact, at the time, this was exactly the case. As of now, Vietnam, as in later <laughs> think pieces, has resurged as one of the premier economies to grow outside of the post uh, technically post-COVID lockdown system scenarios. It is only, it's second to China only, with China this year reporting a 18% growth GDP-wise and just their first quarter, and then Vietnam also is reporting an 8% growth in their export, in their economy this year alone, which is quite a feat considering the nation, island nation, or not island nation, excuse me, considering the nation itself, which in fact, has been surging in demands. They logistically and exports have been just booming. Most of its economy has been just soaring overall because of the let alone manufacturing that has moved from China and has came into Vietnam's exclusive economic zones. And also the logistics of transporting those shipments and stuff. And Overall, uh, Vietnam has been quite a successful case and one of the only ones, if not the only one in Southeast Asia that has a positive growth GDP-wise compared to other nations such as Thailand and, say, Cambodia and others, which is saying quite a bit to the resurgence of a star of Southeast Asia, if you will. In my article, uh, The Tigers of Asia, or my little snippet of it, I talk about literally the complete 180 uh, success rate of Vietnam compared to this point in time. And since then, tourism has been still in the decline because Vietnam is, ex is locked down tight. But that has been hurt, but it hasn't overall hurt the GDP of Vietnam in the grand total of everything. It's not enough to drag down its economy, and let alone it's been a pretty strong recovery for the nation itself. So with that said, our next section, Out of the Loop, featuring some interesting stories that are just not mainstream usually. So, starting with Doggo, not Wino. Ever had the urge to share a brew with your good boy or girl? Well, now you can. Bush Beer released a beer for your dog called Dog Brews. So while you sit in quarantine throwing back those brews as you watch your life plunge further down the drain, you can also drag your dog down with you. But hurry, they are limited in supply and being sold online. A four-pack is going for $9.99. In reality, uh, I never actually purchased looked into it or actually delved into this story any further and honestly it sounds fun but at the same time i mean i guess it's interesting it's very novel that's for sure i always anytime there's a dog or one of my friend's dogs or parent my family's dogs and they're all around me and i have a beer or whatnot i always try to encourage them to drink it and they sniff they're always like "Ooh, ooh, what's the smell what's the smell but they never partake which I wonder if this would actually, I wonder what inside of these beers actually encourages these, uh, our, our uh, companions to actually partake or drink or eat, or I guess mostly drink, obviously, if it's a beer, but 
Still, it's really interesting to think, hmm, should I get my dog drunk today? Hmm, I guess that's one way to say you're not an alcoholic. If you're drinking alone, say, nope, my pooch has got one, so I'm not alone drinking. So our next story goes into Giants of the Deep. Ooh. We all know the Kraken and how they tormented sailors and ships of the high seas for centuries in folklore and film. But have you ever wondered how those squid boys survived the oxygen-deprived frozen depths of the ocean floor? It's certainly not science fiction, but taking a look at the science would make you wish it was. Try epigenics and RNA modifications. One alters the chemical makeup of the DNA, and the other reduces the protein production of the body. Yeah, it makes you wish you didn't skip biology now. I remember reading this article, and I was extremely fascinated, because I do also, for fun fact, for all the people listening, I have a fascination with squids and octopi, or octopuses, which it's really just, I don't know why, I just always thought they were fascinating. Some sea creatures fascinate me to no ends, and these guys are one of them, and imagining these giant menacing squids, giant squids just floating around, and then they go straight to the bottom, which is obviously, you know, craziness. The amount of pressure down there, the cold, just the lack of any sunlight, just, you know, and then you see these behemoths coming up here, and, and like, you know, they're just giants. They're just, just these monstrosities of just alien proportions, and yet, you know, their chemical makeup is just so strange. Their DNA just allows them to do... It's modified to handle the extreme pressures of the deep ocean and the cold, the frigid ice temperatures, and just in general, like, surviving in those depths for so long. It's just... It's interesting. And then you come up to the surface and you see these guys just, like, bellowing about, and you're like, what in tarnation is this? I don't know. I always thought it was fascinating. And then, you know... Always the stories of like the Kraken and coming up, you know, you see in the Pirates of the Caribbean just like destroying these ships and stuff. And these guys were never big enough to do that that I know of. I've never seen any stories where actual live ones, but in the folklores and stuff, they're everywhere. So, I mean, there had to have been an episode where one accidentally attacked a, sh a boat of some sort. Obviously, they don't, they're very, they're not. I, they're as docile as a creature is allowed to be, is what I'll put it as. I don't necessarily know their behavior patterns and how often do they aggressively attack humans, but I've never really read anything that says they are hostile. But I don't think they're also docile in the sense of like, oh, they wouldn't harm a fly. But that's also considering they are an animal, a creature. You can't read what its mind's saying or what it's thinking. So you just assume that unless you provoke it or cause it harm or have any intentions of causing it harm, that it will become aggressive and fight. But I mean, who's to say like any human has never hurt an animal or has, you know, came at it with the intention of murdering it and one of two things, devour it, well, three things. One of uh, devouring it, um, using its body for materials, or selling it. And that is the, that is the uh, incumbrance of, like, what a human is. So, there's your TED Talk for the day. And now, moving on to our next one, AI versus AI. No sector or arena is safe from artificial intelligence, yet some areas will need to embrace the new technology sooner rather than later, if we are to survive. We, when we think of espionage, we romanticize 007 or think of CIA and FBI agents like the Bourne movies. But did you ever think about AI Unit 001? Soon, it won't be matches just... Machines just gathering information and data for human decision makers or intelligence consumers. It will be for other machines. The time is rapidly approaching where humans in the intelligence communities simply cannot compete with the computing power of AI. Will the US be on the forefront or will some other actor upstage them in this? Now, this one was an interesting concept because now you're talking about not just ADA and computer, ADA, I mean AI and computer systems just, you know, 
computing and gathering large amounts of data, but now they're actively going out and not only gathering data, but acting on behalf of their human counterparts with the data that they other AIs have gathered or other machines. And it's just, it's a mind boggling thought at the time when I was reading this to think, wow, you know, to some point we will have our own sort of <laughs> computer making just machines that, computer making machines, yes, decision making machines that will use so much data to, you know, make decisions for us humans or in the action of it. Which is to say, kind of scary and Matrix like in the sense of what if they you obviously, you know, get the idea of, hmm, humans are the destructive force that we need to eliminate or control. And then all of a sudden you get that whole bit and we become exactly like the cattle or the pigs or the chicken industries where we're con captured, contained, and made into a miserable existence because machines deem us to live that lifestyle. Or even worse, they decide to eliminate us, which is also a prospect that's very terrifying. But at the same sense, what are you, I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to stop this? No one can stop the progress of time. All you can ever do is adapt and innovate and continue forward in some positive light or in some cases, very, very dark light. But so with that last article read and explained, we are at the end of this section. And that is all for today's Think Peace podcast. I do hope you have enjoyed what you've listened to, and I hope that next time you'll be back faster than you could say, what, there's a new one out available already? What? And you'll say it even better this time. So if you haven't already, please go subscribe to my newsletter. Also, I have a website in the links below. All my information from the podcast, all the articles are available in the description below if you want to go and recap what I've talked about or go in more into depth about what I've talked about today. And also, again, any support is better than no support at all. So please consider liking this, subscribing, and also sharing it to friends and family who may be interested in it. And as always... Be safe and, you know, keep it classy.